Hi, I'm Nick McCarthy, and thank you for joining us for this spotlight screening of Keith Haring's Street Art Boy. Uh, I know the first time I saw this film when we were considering it for the festival that I was left in tears at the end of it, um, not just thinking about Keith Haring and his contributions to our city, but um, the strength of our city uh, from the 70s through now um, to always fight back as well. Um, so uh, it's my absolute pleasure to have the director and executive producer of Keith Haring Street Art Boy here. Please welcome director Ben Anthony and executive producer Janet Lee. Thank you for joining. Thanks for asking. Thanks for having us. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and where are you right now? Are you both in London? Yeah, we're in yeah. London. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for Sunny autumn you... afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ben. Say we're only, a few street, we're only a street, actually a few streets from each other. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we can phone or whatever. Um, but uh, but yeah, once again, thank you both for joining us so so much. Um, you know, we're we're really delighted to have this film, and I want to congratulate you again on this um, this gorgeous work. Um, I'm uh, of course curious. You know, um, Keith Haring is such an iconic artist um, who has inspired so much, um, and I was you know. Curious about your relationship and connection to Keith's work and the moment of inception where you decided, you know what, I really want to make sure that Keith's story is preserved in this documentary. Um, well, when I was a student, we had a poster of Keith's work up in the room. And uh, and also, and, and ever since then, everywhere I've gone, I've known all around the world, you'll spot a Keith Herring somewhere on a mug, on someone's badge, on a t-shirt, and I just thought he's so ubiquitous. And then I, 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 the more I thought about it, I thought I, I noticed that it was going to be 30 years since he died and 40 years since the onset of the AIDS epidemic. And I thought everyone knows about Keith's work. They, they know they recognize the art, but they don't know the story. They don't know his life story. They don't know about his activism. They, they don't know about his passion and it, it's a good time right now to tell the story. So so that's how I sold it to the BBC and to PBS. Like now is the time. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I mean similarly, I, I grew up with uh, Keith Herring's work in the, in the early eighties and it, you know, it was on record covers that records that I had and friends had t-shirts and so on. And, and uh, I my dad took me to New York when I was a teenager in my early teens and I saw a lot of his work on the streets there and was really taken with it because it seemed to somehow sum up something about New York that there was a kind of cultural sort of fusion of dancing and art and music and, and it was like the kind of it, it, they were like symbols that represented New York culturally at that point so something really sort of simple and exciting about that and I think that's that's why it's always stayed with me as as an integral part of my my teenage years, I guess. Yeah, that's great. I mean, his his legacy is so enduring, and I love to hear sort of the energy that you both felt like from just like thinking about Keith's work and then presenting it um, in this way. Uh, I'd love to talk a bit about the editing and the music of the documentary, um, Ben and Janet, if you would uh, just speak about sort of your choices for music. Um, I know so much we're talking about is uh, the fluidity of Keith's work. So I was curious how, you, you know, your sense of capturing that within the documentary. Well, I'm one of the run that when, when Janet asked me if I would, you know, be interested in making the film, I, I, you know, it was an opportunity finally after many years of making films to be able to pack a film full of music that I really dearly love from, from, uh, you know, Iggy Pop right through to, you know, Larry Levan's Par Paradise Garage mixes and so on. Uh, it really spanned an era that, um, an amazing musical era. So the, 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 the music is a really integral, important part of the storytelling because as the music scene evolves in New York City, so the art world scene evolves and so on. So the, the music was always going to be kind of front and center for the film. It was always, we'd always, I, mean, I remember early treatment said, you know, or have an absolutely banging soundtrack or whatever, you know, it was always like really, 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 really a key part of the film because I think that a lot of people remember Keith in the context of what's happening in terms of music and so on and club life and, and, and the kind of cultural sort of development of the city. So, so that, that was, um, it's actually really difficult choosing the music because they're at any given moment, they were always, uh, you know, six 
really great records that were competing for that particular slot in the story. So it was a kind of a nice problem to have in a way. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and in terms of the energy of the editing and so on, it was just so obvious that the way Keith lived his life and the way he even painted was just so fast and spontaneous and just brimming with energy that he worked hard and he played hard and it was all very fast. And the film just felt like it needed to have that about it as well in order to kind of capture his spirit. I think you do a marvelous job of, you know, bringing his uh, his energy to life. Um, I'd love to hear a bit um, about the research done um, in finding a lot of the really, really wonderful uh, archival audio uh, clips that I had never heard before. Um, sort of what was the process of research and deciding, you know, what, what was that? Well, well the, the, ha the Keith Herring Foundation were wonderful from the start. When, when we, when I, before I sold the documentary, I had to make sure they were on board. And when we approached them, they were just so fantastic, and so open and said, you can have everything we've got. You can use everything we've got. Here it is. Have it all. You know, we, we want the best film made about Keith possible. So, so they were absolutely brilliant, weren't they, Ben? I mean, they, yeah, were, so, yeah. they were so helpful. And they had, do you want to talk about the, the audio yeah. recording that they had? Yeah. Well, like very early on, we were sort of working out, well, how are we going to tell this story? You know, we want to tell it in Keith's own words. That was something we knew about right from the start. So um, we thought, well, how are we going to do that? We're going to piece it together from various interviews that he's done on TV and so on. And then actually, uh, the, the foundation have recordings that were made when Keith's biography was being written. Now, Keith knew he was going to die. And so he commissioned a guy called John Gruen to write the book of his life. And John recorded those conversations. And all of those audio cassettes are held by the foundation. And they gave us access to those recordings. So it's a real gift as a filmmaker because essentially Keith was looking back at his life um, and detailing every, every moment of it. And we just obviously just just use those so there are there are the one or two other audio clips from elsewhere but pretty much they mainly come from the the john gruen interview what is kind of interesting is that keith's very matter of fact about his life and he said oh this happened and then that happened and then this happened and then that happened he didn't really analyze it too much but he gave an amazing list of what happened and then so as a filmmaker, I wanted to know what those things really meant to him and meant, meant to the people around him. And that's where his friends came in. That's where his, his, his closest friends came in and his family came in to really help understand what kind of made him tick and what he cared about in life and what his passions were. Because Keith, in that interview, is actually quite matter of fact about things. So it's a, it was a kind of a it was a combination of using the, the friends and family interviews and his kind of blow by blow account of his life that sort of helped tell his story. Yeah, no, it definitely illuminates it. And uh, I love that, you know, you go back to Kutztown, Pennsylvania um, in Keith's hometown. And um, I think the interviews with the parents really lend an intimacy that I, I didn't even know as someone who knows quite a bit about Keith Haring. Um, I was curious about the decision to definitely talk to um, Keith's parents and also what it was like to shoot them and anything additional you'd like to, to speak about. Um, the, well, I mean, we, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, my filmmaking background is not, is not really in arts documentaries. It's more, more uh, tends to be more serious, if you like, films uh, about people going through difficult situations and so on, difficult uh, sections of their life. And, and obviously family is what I, these are people that I'm really used to interviewing. So that's, so it was always a, a no brainer to me in a way to meet the people that knew Keith when he was a kid, people who knew where he was coming from. Um, the people who may potentially have struggled with the choices that he made in life. And I, cause I knew there would be a poignancy in that. So it was always really important to, to interview his parents. They were kind of, I wouldn't say they were hesitant, but they weren't, you know, jumping up and down to be interviewed. So that took, it took a while. It took, they needed to explain to them why it was so important and so on. Um, but I think it is the kind of part of the film in many ways, because, you know, they're really talking about Keith, their son. Everybody else knew Keith, the artist, or Keith, the party animal, or Keith, the art. You know, Keith, the uh, the student, or whatever. But they, what they were really talking about was the boy that they had raised. So, you, I knew that the emotional heart of the film would would really come through them. 
Yeah, it certainly does. And I love their shoes too, that you still capture all of his like older art and like how, how proud the mom seems to be for wearing these shoes too for her son. So um, I thought it was a, a lovely moment. Of course, I love seeing Fab Five Freddy and Kenny Sharp and Bill T. Jones again. Um, what was that like to sort of go through the process of selecting who Keith's best friends you would interview? Um, and uh, I guess who may have surprised you the most with some stories that they share with you about Keith? Uh, I mean, it was just a complete pleasure. You know, these are all like luminaries, like people that I've admired from afar f since I was a teenager. So to be in the same room as Fab Five Freddy or Lee Canones or Kenny Scharf was just like extraordinary. And, and it was, they made it so easy. You know, they were all incredibly gracious and, and actually really keen to talk about Keith, you know, because they, uh, they were clearly so fond of him that they just wanted to share their, memories of him and so on and it was they you know i think they felt it was important to communicate certain things about him which maybe maybe people didn't really understand so they made that really really easy sometimes it was a bit intimidating being in the room with these kind of cultural icons for me anyway um uh partly because i admire them so much um but it really it was um it was a pleasure and in many cases the interviews could have gone on two or three times longer than they did um, for you know various reasons, we 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 couldn't do that. So, um, it one of the things I wanted to mention was it was I thought felt it was really important to populate the film with a lot of people because I think that was a big part of Keith's existence. Was he was so social, he knew so many people, he was so popular that I wanted to bring a lot of voices into the film to make so that like lots of people had lots of things to say about him. Um, so yeah, I mean he um, he he clearly was just a sort of remarkable guy and that people kind of adored him, you know, and uh, people, it wasn't hard to get people to, 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 to take the opportunity to talk, to talk about him. Um, he was so brave as well, wasn't he? He was just so brave from the start. You know, I, I hope that comes across. That's what I always think about him. He was doing something that other people hadn't done. And he was just brave every day in his life, in a way. And took yeah. so many risks all the time. Yeah, he seemed to have an intrinsic connection to public spaces too, and to communication, um, you know, speaking of especially, you know, um, how immediately taken he was with graffiti um, and how the insight he had so immediately and, and how this could be a public connector for, you know, human community. So um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, with New York City, um, I know you're both in London um, and this is a BBC production. Um, what do you hope that, um, you know, both British audiences, but also audiences around the world will learn most about Keith um, that they may not have before, or at least New York City too? <laughs> What will they learn most about Keith? Yeah, well, well what do you what hope they take away from this about, you know? Well, well it'd be great if they wish they'd been in New York City in that period. <laughs> <laughs> it's great if they felt like that, oh, I wish I'd been there. I wish I'd been to Paradise Garage, even just for one night. Or, or I wish I'd seen his drawings on the black sheets in, you know, the advertising hoardings in, in the subway. I just wish I'd been there. and. But I wasn't, but how great that I can now see it, that we've got this film that shows it as it was. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> his belief so much about art being for the people too, you know, mm. with film. Film is a medium that can be shared with many people and provide access to this art that someone may have found to be um, more highfalutin. So I think, you know, capturing his story in um, as beautiful and succinct a documentary as you do um, is, you know, quite an honor to his legacy. I just so say about New York, I think we were, we we're really keen to have New York feel like it as a kind of character in the film, because even though New York is sort of continues to be held in really high esteem as far as art and culture and music and so on is concerned, I think back in the 80s, there was it was totally unrivaled as a as a kind of uh, cauldron of kind of creativity. And I think that was really important that the film explained that to a degree, you know, and the circumstances, how that came about and how it was, just how unique it was and what a blend of influences it was. And um, in, in some ways, you know, I don't know that it would have been possible without New York, Keith's career, but just because of the set of circumstances that it provided him with. So that really felt like 
it was harking back to a time when New York really was just this extraordinary place. I mean, obviously a big element of the film is that is that you know commercialization of art kind of comes into the picture and that kind of changes things. And um, so it was really about trying to kind of capture that moment before that had happened and what a kind of unique moment it was where, where New York was just this singular place where things happened that have gone on to really, in many cases, define genres, you know, in terms of music and, uh, and art and so on. So I think we were always really keen to reflect that extraordinary period in, in uh, New York's history. In fact, you know, cultural history. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I love um, how you talk about sort of um, how commerce is brought up and like very much Keith Credo within like commerce and art and opening of the pop shop as well. Um, can you speak a bit to sort of addressing that with the landscape of New York City too, or the, the importance of, you know, discussing Keith's commercial aspects perhaps, or the sensitivity around that? Or no sensitivity around it. Honestly, it's true. Uh, uh, what do you think, Janet? I've just got things to say, Bad, but I, uh, I don't want to just do all this. <laughs> no, no, you, you talk, Ben. You say what you think what? about it because it, it is an interesting element. You, you, you say what you found when you, you ask people about it. Well, it's such a funny thing, isn't it? Because, you know, uh, even though the world of the value, you know, art and its value and so on, questions around that is just completely about money and so on for m many people there's a kind of um it's kind of uh, frowned upon to sort of attach you know money to art and so on it's seen as sort of missing the point and i think what was so interesting about the pop shop was that it was about a very explicit transaction between buying art and owning art and whether that was a good thing or a bad thing and and he got in a lot of trouble for it you know he he, he a lot of people really sneered and frowned at him but actually for him it was a really simple simple idea and that was that actually if we make art affordable for ordinary people to buy something they appreciate they like the look of then why not you know and why not try and break that down a bit so that it isn't art just isn't about you know people with the means to to own it and stuff anyone can own it and um you know the, people think that's called selling out or they think it's called commercialism and other people think it's about making your work accessible and actually democratizing it and I don't think some some people have, I think, thought that Keith was a bit cynical in that way. But I just don't think that's true at all. I think he genuinely had a very perhaps slightly naive view that you could sell you could sell merchandise and you'd be doing everybody a favor. You weren't looking to get rich. I genuinely don't think he was that bothered about money. He enjoyed success. There's no doubt about that. But I don't think he was really interested in money. Once he'd made some money, he was happy uh, if it meant he could go out and do the things he wanted to do. That was fine. I don't think he was all about building up, you know, a huge fortune or anything. I think he genuinely, and he genuinely wanted people to own his work. He wanted, he liked the idea of people wearing t-shirts with his images on, you know, make of that what you will. But I think it was a, an innocent um, desire rather than a cynical one to kind of cash in on, on his work. Less about copyright, more about access, which I think. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Part of it too. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we have reached uh, our time just for um, a, a final uh, question or thoughts. Um, you know, one thing that I really loved in the film um, was Keith even going to Tokyo and sort of being a global icon. Um, right now, of course, as we see even, um, you know, with the pandemic, we're actually connecting so much more across these lines. I was, um, once again, coming back to sort of what, what do you hope is the global takeaway um, from your film, which I know is playing throughout the world and understanding of Keith? One final I, I hope that they I, I hope that uh, people realize what a great artist he was and that just because you're popular doesn't mean that you're that, the, that your work's any less worthy and I hope they see that he wanted that and the foundation raised so much money for good works from from his art and the pop shop you can still buy badges from the pop shop now online. And that's just an amazing thing. The money's not going into somebody's bank account, somebody you know, it, it, to be to get rich. The money is being used for fantastic causes. So everything that he believed in is still happening now in his name, which is a wonderful thing. And everybody around the world will see it when they watch the film. I hope. Yeah, I I, mean, I, I, totally, I totally agree with that. I think that you know, it says something about how 
art can make a difference to people um in in a very real way you know the way he interacted with ordinary people in fact they were the people he was most comfortable with despite his celebrity and his fame and so on that actually what he wanted to do was transform people's lives by by offering up some public art that they would see every day on their commute to work or their walk to school and um and it would do something to them that would you know affect their life in a positive way and i think that I think that there's room for more of that and the commercialization of art does seem to have taken over somewhat. And so hopefully by shining a light on Keith and his work that people might think twice about, you know, what is the value of art, you know, beyond, beyond uh, how much a painting might be worth. Or what's art for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. And also a shout out. I know you mentioned the Keith Haring Foundation, which does really great work um, in the community in honor of Keith and his life and his legacy. Um, and I want to thank you both, Ben and Janet, um, for, for doing Keith another wonderful service of contributing his story even further and wider um, throughout the world. So thank you once again for being here and making this gorgeous documentary. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this very special Spotlight virtual screening, as well as conversation with the filmmakers. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, and another uh, documentary we'd love to recommend about a hometown hero is Maurice Hines, Bring Them Back. Um, so uh, whether you wanna watch Keith Haring's Street Art Boy again, uh, or you wanna check out more, please go to newfest.org. Um, there's over 120 films that are still at your fingertips uh, throughout October until October 27th. And join us for our closing night film, No Hard Feelings, on October 27th. All right, thank you so much.